Welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, and this is the recap of trial day 11 in the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed case. Grab your red solo cup, pour yourself a drink, and let's recap. The day started with Julie Nagel being recalled to the stand to complete her testimony from yesterday. The only consequential testimony that we got in the five minutes she was on the stand was that the day after seeing the mysterious blob that was about five to six feet long, the next day she realized it was a body. And when she had that realization, she did absolutely nothing to inform the authorities. The next witness was Terry Kuhn a forensic veterinary scientist at UC Davis. This witness was taken out of order, perhaps for scheduling purposes, for convenience to her, whatever the reason was, she was the next witness. She introduced evidence that she received from the Commonwealth State Police Crime Lab swabs of a dog's DNA, or rather the swabs were looking for dog DNA, canine DNA. She said the evidence was submitted with a document saying the swabs were taken from a shirt. They were asked to determine the canine species, if any, in order to get a reference sample. The testing showed no sign of canine DNA from the swab, but it did find pig DNA. The DNA could have come from sources like not a live animal, like cooked or raw food, perhaps, but we don't know, and neither did she. On cross, the defense established that the only items tested were the swabs that allegedly came from a shirt, not the actual shirt itself. When testing, she assumes that on cross, the defense established that the only items tested were the swabs that allegedly came from a shirt, but the actual shirt was never tested. When testing, the witness assumes that proper swabbing techniques were used to swab a source material, but she can't confirm or deny that they were taken because she was not present when the swabs were taken. She admitted that she has no idea whether the swabs provided by the Commonwealth State Police Crime Lab, whether they were contaminated or any of the handling practices of the swabs prior to when she received the swabs were done properly. They went through best practices for collecting swab samples, how it's best to moisten the sterilized swab with distilled water to get better collection, photograph the area of the source material where the swab is being taken from, how it's not best practices to collect biological material in blood, like blood in plastic, because that would encourage the growth of bacteria and mold. That's a shout out to the Red Solo Cup. And the witness said that she was not told that the swabs were taken from a garment that had blood on it. With regard to the findings that no canine nuclear DNA was found on the swabs, certain inhibitors were found. Inhibitors are any type of chemical that prohibit the enzyme from making copies that are required to test for DNA. So types of inhibitors could be stuff like blood or dirt or garment dye, and they stop the PCR process from happening, resulting in there being no results. Inhibitors can be found in three instances, she explained. When the canine nuclear DNA is degraded, let's see, if the swab is obscured by inhibitors, or if there is no canine DNA present. So two of the three reasons allow for the idea that the DNA could exist. It just can't be seen because it could be either degraded or obscured. In this situation, there were inhibitors found. So in the qPCR test that was conducted with the sample swabs, it's not that there was no canine DNA present. It was that no canine DNA was detected by that test. And the defense attorney quoted, provided a quote relevant to the situation, which is the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Pig DNA that was detective could have come from dog treats like pig ears. The witness testified that while saliva is a rich source of DNA under fingernails, or dog nails is not a good source of DNA. 
presumably the scratches found on John O'Keefe's body were created by nails, by sharp nails. And witness pointed out that dog nails or even human fingernails are not a good source of finding DNA. This witness performed two different tests, the qPCR test, which tests for nuclear DNA, and the Meat ID test, which tests for mitochondrial DNA. The qPCR test result showed no nuclear DNA was found. The Meat ID test found no inhibitors and that the pig DNA was found. To be perfectly honest with you, I did get kind of lost in this testimony and I was listening to it at two times speed and I just couldn't rewind and try listening to it not one more time because I realized it was still the beginning of the day and we had hours to go. So apologies if any of that is is inaccurate in any way. On redirect, the witness said that she gave the state lab certain protocols to follow in taking the swabs and packaging them to be sent to her, and that the swab packaging that she did receive from the state lab was as she expected. On recross, we heard from defense counsel that the person at the lab that the witness spoke to and gave the protocols had failed certain proficiencies, and that's all we heard because of sustained objections. So we're left wondering whether the swabs that were taken were taken with proficiency, and we're hope, I'm hoping that the person in the lab who actually took the swabs will testify so we can assess her competence and maybe see her history, her performance history. The next witness was Ryan Nagel, Julie Nagel, who saw the black blob, her brother. He said that Friday night, he, his friend Ricky, and his girlfriend at the time, Heather, were bar hopping. They started at McCarthy's. Yes, the same McCarthy's that John and Karen were at that night, then left and went to Hillside, another bar across town. They left around midnight and went to pick up his sister, Julie, who had texted him asking to be picked up from, from the Albert house. Ricky was driving. The witness, Ryan, was in the front passenger seat and Heather was in the back seat. As they were approaching Fairview Road, which was on their left, he saw a black SUV coming towards them, which also turned onto Fairview Road. Black SUV at this point was in front of the truck that the witness was in. He said he saw it stop, pull to a stop in front of 34 Fairview. Ricky stopped his truck right in front of the driveway. At this point, the black SUV was one car length in front of Ricky's truck. The witness says he never saw anyone exit the black SUV. He texted Julie that he was pulling up and she took about two minutes to come out to the truck. He said she came out the side door of the house, down the driveway, and he opened the passenger door because he thought she was getting in. Instead, she asked them if they wanted to go inside, which they declined. So she said she would go back in and get another ride home. She was outside a total of 30 to 45 seconds. During this time, the witness noticed the brake lights on the black SUV were on and it moved up another car length away from where he was sitting at the moment. Julie came out of the house. That was the only time the witness saw it move. He didn't notice any damage to the vehicle, didn't notice tire tracks in the snow or footprints in the snow. Once Julie got back inside the house, Ricky pulled out to go around the black SUV. He didn't have to reverse or anything, just pulled away from the curb. When they pulled alongside the black SUV, he saw a person inside with the interior center light on. It was a woman with long hair. It seemed like she was looking straight ahead with hands at 10 and 2. He didn't notice anybody else in the SUV, but he wasn't really looking. He was looking past them to ensure that his sister got back inside the house safely. He never heard anything coming from the SUV, no loud noises or voices. The witness showed us using pictures and a very shaky green pointer light where the vehicles were. Cross-examination started with the witness saying he'd not been contacted by anybody in the Albert or McCabe families about that night. Massachusetts State Police interviewed him on February 7th. He didn't remember Proctor's name, but he did remember the trooper had a partner named Buknik. 
In that interview, he told them about the friends that he was with that night. In May 2023, the witness spoke to somebody who was not the Commonwealth and not the defense, and it was the feds, but the jury's not supposed to know that. Anyway, he told these other people that when he first pulled up to 34 Fairview, the black SUV was one to one and a half car lengths ahead of them. And by the time he left, the black SUV was about three car lengths ahead. No other car or vehicle pulled in between Ricky's car and the black SUV. So there was full view of the black SUV for the entire time that Ricky's car was there. Fence asked the witness about an earlier statement that he made under oath where he said that when Julie came outside, they spoke about five minutes, not the 30 to 45 seconds that he testified to on direct. He admitted to making that prior statement. He said he never observed any damage to any of the black SUV's taillights. He never noticed anything out of the ordinary or saw it in reverse. He didn't see it hit a pedestrian. He didn't see anyone laying on the ground around the SUV. Nothing. The next witness was Heather Maxson, Ryan Nagel's ex-girlfriend, who was with him the night of the incident. Her testimony, up until the time that they were turning onto Fairview, was the same as Ryan. What she added was that when the black SUV turned right to go onto Fairview Road, just before Ricky turned left onto Fairview, she noticed in the black SUV a white woman driving and a white man in the passenger seat. How she saw them, I have no idea. She also said that during the time they were sitting there outside 34 Fairview, she did not see the SUV move any distance the entire time. She did not notice any damage to the SUV or see anyone exit the SUV or any footprints around it. She could tell that the car was running, the exterior lights were on, and the interior light was on as well. When Julie came outside to speak with them, she was there for three to five minutes. Julie went back inside the house and was fully in the house before they started pulling away. As they drove by the SUV, the witness saw the female in the driver's seat just sitting there. She didn't see the male, but said she wasn't really looking intently. On cross, her testimony was that a window was rolled down, not a door opened, to speak with Julie when she exited the house. Her testimony boiled down to, she saw a white woman with long hair and a white guy in the black SUV. And a few minutes later, when passing the SUV, she only saw the woman in the car. She never noticed anyone leave the vehicle or any commotion around the vehicle, and she never saw any damage to the vehicle. So where was John at that point is my question. The next witness was Ricky Dentrono. He was with Ryan Nagel and Heather Maxson and driving his Ford F-150 that night. He testified that he doesn't recall there being any vehicle that he yielded to while turning onto Fairview, and that once he got to 34 Fairview, he parked directly in front of the driveway and that there was a black SUV already parked in front of the house about 10 to 20 yards in front of where he parked. The vehicle was running. He didn't see any damage. He never saw anyone get out of the vehicle. He also did not see any interior lights inside the vehicle. He said that when Julie came out of the house, she walked up to his passenger window, which was open to speak with her. He did not believe the passenger door was opened at any time. He estimated the time that Julie spoke with them outside as two minutes. He does not remember anything specific about the black SUV moving or pulling up along the street while they were parked there. On cross-examination, he testified that he got to 34 Fairview approximately around midnight. On May 16th, 2023, he made his first statement to somebody who was not the Commonwealth and not the defense. It was the feds again. The first time he spoke with the state was in September 2023, about 21 months after the incident. So almost two years later is when the state first decided to call this witness, who was an eyewitness to seeing the black SUV. He confirmed his memory that when he pulled up to 34 Fairview, the black SUV was already parked there. There was nothing obstructing his view of the black SUV parked a few yards in front of his truck, including a Jeep with a snow plow in front of it at all. Now, this Jeep has been mentioned many times with the witnesses that were outside that night. 
I have no context for what they're talking about, but my assumption is that the Commonwealth will at some point present some testimony regarding this Jeep being seen at or around the property. We're just not there yet. He finished up his testimony, letting us know that he didn't see any action in or around the SUV. Nobody got out, nobody got in, and nobody was around the SUV that he noticed. He did not look inside the SUV while passing it. He was concentrating on driving. So obviously he didn't notice whether there was anybody in the passenger seat or not. The next witness was Allie McCabe, the daughter of Jen and Matt McCabe. She is the person who picked up Colin Albert, who is a close friend of hers, and her aunt, Nicole Albert's nephew. She went to pick up Colin from 34 Fairview, who was over there celebrating her cousin Brian Jr.'s birthday. When she arrived at the house, she texted Colin that she had arrived. She didn't see any of the parents' vehicles in the driveway when she got there, and shortly after he came out and got into her front passenger seat. She said that Colin's demeanor was normal in every way, and she didn't notice any injuries when he got into her car. After seeing him get inside his residence, she went home. It was about 1230. In August 2023, she met with two troopers and provided them with text messages between her and Colin. The Commonwealth asked her to authenticate a printout, which she said were the text messages and Colin's contact information that she provided to the troopers. Before the exhibit was entered into evidence, the defense objected. At this point, the jury was excused in a quick voir dire about the document. Basically, the Commonwealth asked her questions to establish the accuracy of the text messages depicted on the printouts, including the time shown and the accuracy of the photos and the time shown there. The defense asked the witness whether she knew that the time shown in text messages and on photos can easily be manipulated. The objection was sustained by the judge and the judge brought the jury back. So the Commonwealth ended up publishing the printout of the text message that showed Colin asking to be picked up, the witness agreeing, the witness indicating that she had arrived at 34 Fairview to pick him up at 1210 a.m. Next, she was asked about additional screenshots she provided to the state police. She stated they were pictures from her phone showing Colin taken on February 11, 2022 at Nicole and Brian Albert's house. She said the picture was taken at a party had at the house to celebrate one of the Albert sons returning home from the military. On cross-examination, the defense established the very close relationship the witness has with Colin Albert, their best friends. She said no investigator ever asked her for a copy of the screenshot of the text message until the summer of 2023, about one and a half years after the incident. By that time, she had gotten an upgraded phone which she said downloaded all the data from her old phone onto it. She doesn't remember when she took the screenshot, whether it was off of her old phone she used in January 2022 or the new phone she got in December 2022. In any event, she never provided it to anybody because she didn't think it was relevant since nobody pointed any fingers at Colin yet. And because, quote, Colin wasn't there when John was there, close quote. No investigator asked her for her physical phone at any point, the old phone or the new phone. In August 2023, the witness provided testimony in a hearing. By then, no official had spoken with her once, not once, about the events of that night. After providing the testimony, only then did state troopers interview her by Zoom while she was at home. Next, the defense asked her about her savviness in using an iPhone. The witness is 20 years old, and she's had an iPhone since she was 12 or 13 years old, so about seven or eight years of experience using iPhone technology. The witness admitted that if text in a text message were deleted, there would be no indication of it. It would just disappear. The witness denied knowing that timestamps can easily be manipulated on the iPhone by changing your time zone in the settings. The defense next confirmed her testimony that after picking up Colin from the Albert house, she dropped him off around 1215 or 1220, then went directly home, arriving at 1230-ish, and did not leave home again that night. Benson asked her about the Life360 app, which she and her family uses to track each other's locations. They went through a litany of Life360 records from witnesses' cell phone 
detailing timestamps from about midnight to well after midnight that grossly contradict the testimony the witness previously gave. The records indicate she left home at 1226 on one on January 29th and went to Canton High School and went back home, then left home, completed a 12 mile drive, went back and forth some more, ended up back at Canton High School and got home sometime after 1.30. The witness reviewed the Life 360 records and maintained her version of events. On redirect, the witness said she never changed or manipulated the timestamps in her text messages. Regarding the Life 360 record, she said it takes seven to 10 minutes to drive to Canton High School, and it'd be impossible to get there in the two or three minutes, like what the app indicated. Commonwealth was allowed to ask the witness questions about the treatment Colin and her family have received as a result of being implicated in this case. As she described the harassment of people calling her house and emailing her and her school, she broke down into tears. Now, the defense objected to the line of questions that begged for an emotional answer, but the judge ruled that they had opened the door. I personally thought that that was the wrong ruling and there was nothing probative or evidentiary about the public sentiment or how it impacted the witness that should have been admitted. Of course, the defense didn't recross the witness at that point. The whole ruling was bad. I think the judge knew what would happen and she allowed it to happen. There were some other questionable rulings she made today that have caused me to question whether there's any bias coming from the bench. I won't go so far to say as I think she is biased, but the question has been raised in my mind, and now I'm wondering if there were any pretrial motions requesting her recusal. Remember, this case is completely new to me. I didn't watch any of the hearings leading up to the trial. I have only heard of some cursory things in passing. I was not following the case at all before the first day of the trial. So it's all new to me. Now, the next witness was Colin Albert, Chris and Julie Albert's son, and Brian and Nicole Albert's nephew. He got to 34 Fairview between 1030 and 11 that Friday night. He testified that he thinks it was Allie who dropped him off and that he stayed there for about an hour and a half while he was there. He didn't go into any area of the house other than the kitchen where everybody was congregated and the bathroom. He tested, he texted Allie, Allie McCabe, who was saved in his phone about picking him up from 34 Fairview. She agreed on texting him when she arrived. He said that he left the house through the side door where he saw Brian and Nicole Albert going inside. This contradicts their testimony. At least Nicole Albert, who said she entered the house through the door and she saw him in the front door foyer. So after seeing them, on his way out and on their way in, he told them he was going home and told them goodbye. He got into the car with Allie, though he doesn't remember which side of the driveway it was parked. He doesn't remember where he got into the vehicle, passenger side, the driver's side. He doesn't remember whether there was anybody else in the car or whether there was anybody else in the car when she ultimately dropped him at home. He testified that when he got home, he went inside, immediately went to his parents' room to tell them that he's home and say goodnight. He approximated that time as 1220. We previously heard testimony about how Colin and his family used to live on the same street as John O'Keefe. He testified that his neighborly relationship with John was just fine and he's never had any dispute with him. Back to Friday the 28th into the 29th, the witness testified that he never saw John at 34 Fairview inside the house or outside the house. He said he knew the defendant that she dated John, but hadn't had any interactions with her. The only contact with her was maybe driving by John's house and seeing her and waving. He testified that he provided a text message exchange between he and Allie to state investigators. The text message shown was the same one we saw when Allison testified. The texts indicate that Allie reached 34 Fairview at 12, 10 a.m. when she texted here, so if these texts are accurate, there's no way his parents' testimony that he got home at 12.10 was true. Now, it's important to note that the text messages look a bit of, uh, now it's important to note that the text messages look a bit curious to me. 
I have an iPhone, so I checked it on my messages. When you see a conversation in the text messaging app, each person in the conversation's text is displayed in a text bubble. On the exhibit that was shown in court, only Allie's texts are in a bubble. Colin's responses are not in a bubble. The other thing is these messages occur on two different days. In iPhone text conversations, the date of the conversation will be displayed above the first conversation of that day. So while we may not have seen the date January 28th, because they could have been texting with each other earlier, once the day changed to, date to January 29th at midnight, date January 29th should have been shown. On the photo shown in court, there is no date of January 27th shown before the first message sent that day when they were still exchanging text messages. The final questionable thing in my mind about the text exchange are that these are best friends, yet the text exchange jumped from January 29th, presumably, although there's no tag saying as such, but then the next date shown that the next messages were exchanged was February 20th, 23 days later, for best friends? That alone seems suspicious to me. So we ended day 12 with Colin Albert's direct testimony finished and his cross-examination scheduled to begin tomorrow morning. At the end of day 12, I'm still lost as to the Commonwealth's case against Karen Reed. We still don't know what happened to John O'Keefe. We still haven't gotten any direct evidence against the defendant that might not be touched by bias. I am desperately hoping that the judge will begin moving things along even more. We are on day 12 and the Commonwealth's case is still wide open. Nothing has been resolved. So I hope you will join me again tomorrow as we recap day 13 of the Karen Reed trial. Hopefully we'll get some more information then. I wish you well and I hope to see you tomorrow. Until the next job, peace.